This time of year, I love the change of the weather. I love the, the fall. I love the, the leaves turning. I just love... Wouldn't it be bad and sad? Because we're spoiled. Let's be honest about it. We're spoiled. Am, am I the only spoiled one in here? Or are we all spoiled? Uh, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be sad if it was sunny every day? Because here's the, here's the thing. We would get so tired of the sun. Amen. I mean, we're, the, we're just that type of people. Man, let me tell you something. I love the sun. I love a sunny day. But I love the change of the weather. I love the fall. I love the leaves turning. I love wintertime. Most people don't like to see it snow. Man, I love to see it snow where it just blankets the ground where it just makes everybody stop and slow down. And I love it when... We can't even get out of our driveway where Lynn and I, we're at the house and we just, I, I'm, we're like two little kids. We just love running to the window and uh, watching. My wife, she loves birds and she loves to watch the birds and she'll, she'll put out food for the birds. But I love the snow and I love the rain. Uh, you know, I've seen fire and I've seen rain. Uh, <laughs> that philosopher, that great philosopher, James Taylor, said that, and all the children of the 70s said, amen. I've seen fire, uh, you know. But I love that. I don't know where that was going, but I just, I loved it. But I love watching nature, because you'll even see God in nature, Amen. And we're going, to, we're going to look at something this morning. I, you know, we have squirrels in our, in, our, in our yard, and, you know, they're always chasing each other and just playing. But this time of the year, you'll see the squirrels, and they're starting to pick up nuts, and they'll take it back to their, their home, and they're storing up food for the winter. And, you know, I see stuff like that, and you can't tell me that there's not a God. You can't tell me that there's not a higher power. And you know, I think about even when God was creating, because I believe God is the creator, amen? I believe that God, when he is the creator and when he was creating the animal, see, we couldn't even comprehend how to create an elephant, you know, with the, a, a long snout, or we couldn't figure out how to create a porcupine. We just don't have that imagination, but our God has that type of imagination where he can create an animal to where not only does... It's like a skunk. We have a skunk at our house. And, you know, he's gotten used to us. And we're so used to him, he'll kind of walk by and kind of look at us and then just keep walking. And, you know, but isn't it sad if you're a skunk and everybody runs from you? You know, wouldn't that be a bad thing? But even a skunk, who in their right mind would create an animal such as this where his defense mechanism is, is his smell. We, we worship an awesome God, a creator with such an imagination. And I, I look at the animals and, and here during this time of year, we're seeing the geese fly over. And we're, we'll see them flying in a V. And we'll hear them honking. And... Uh, you know, as a kid, and I, I've shared this with you because I brought this illustration to you in 2010. But I was, I was talking to my dad one day, and it's when I was a boy, and, you know, geese were flying over, and I, and I said, Dad, why do they fly in a V? And my dad, he, he got real serious, and he said, well, son, it's because the one in the front has the map. And I'm, I'm going, what? <laughs> but that was just dad. But have you ever wondered why they fly in a V? God, the Creator, created them like this. And here's the thing. We learn life lessons from this, and we're going to look at this today. And, and like I shared, I shared with this, this with you in 2010, but since we're seeing them fly over, I, I want to remind you of today. In 1972, there was a guy named Robert uh, Dinesh, and he did a research study on this and, and why birds fly in a V. He was a scientist, and everything that he, he found out is documented. So I want you to understand, he is the, um, the one that did the research on this, on the habits of geese and why they fly in a V. So I want you to understand, I'm not brilliant, and I came up with this. This is his study. Now, 
that belongs to him. Now the geese in scripture belongs to God. And that's his. Now the message today belongs to Brother Joy. That's, that's his. But the, the research belongs to, to um, uh, Dr. McNeese. Robert McNeese. And here's the first fact that he found. And let me, let me read this verse. In Psalms 8, 3 through 9, uh, it says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beast of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the pass of the sea. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. There's scripture after scripture after scripture all through the Bible that says God is the creator of everything, the world, animals, the beast of the field, the fish in the sea, they all belong to God. He's the creator. And just like these geese that we're going to look at and their habits, I, I want you to understand, we can learn something from geese. And this is what, there's five points I want, to, I want to share with you today about what we could learn from geese. Here's the first fact. Fact one, as each goose flaps its wing, it creates an uplift for birds to follow. By flying in a V, it gives 71% increase in distance. And I want, I want you to hear this. They fly together because there's strength in numbers. There's strength and there's power. There's endurance in numbers. Now, here's the lesson. People who share a common direction, a, a common good, there's there's strength in that. And I want you to understand, that's why I believe God created the church. And there is strength in numbers in the church. And you know, it's been my heart here lately to be bringing messages of why we need the church. And I want you to understand, you need the church. You need a place where you can go with other believers in Jesus Christ, where you can be encouraged, where you can be strengthened, where you can be united in a common good. Because here's the truth. You go outside these walls, there's people in numbers that are against the body of Christ. There's people in numbers that are against good and righteousness and truth. And I want you to understand, we need to flock together like a, a, a flock of geese. And there's power and there's strength in that. Uh, I shared with you, and, and Bradley's even done this with our young people over here, where you take a, a piece of thread, and you can wrap a piece of thread, and you know he would say, well, break it. And then he would wrap it again. He'd say, break And it's easy to break when it's just one piece of thread. But if you can continue to wrap that and wrap it and wrap it, there becomes strength and becomes stronger the more that you wrap together. I want you to understand. I want you to look at everyone in here and understand I need you and you need me. The lesson we learn from fleet geese is you fly longer, you fly stronger, there's more strength, there's more power, there's more endurance when you're in the body of Christ. Now I want you to hear this truth. We have to, in order to fly as a flock of geese, we've got to have unity. Now, all through the Bible, Jesus talked about unity. Paul talked about unity. Even God talked about unity. In the, in the Tower of Babel, in the, in the Old Testament in Genesis, when the wicked people came together, God made this statement because they had one language, they, had, they were one people, and they said, let's build a tower that will reach up to heaven, make a name for ourselves. And the wickedness, and, and, and the Bible says in Genesis that their hearts were wicked. They were doing it for wicked things. And you know what God's comment? He said, you know what? There's nothing that these people cannot do because they're doing it together. Nothing is impossible with this wicked generation. And you know what God did? He caused confusion to fall on them. He caused all these languages where they couldn't understand them. And because of this confusion, because of this division, because of this, this act of God, it split them up. 
I want you to hear the point of this. When you're working for a common good and when you're working with the body of Jesus Christ and you have Jesus as your lead goose and you have uh, your brother and sister flying with you and you're lifting each other up and you're encouraging each other, let me tell you, there's nothing we can do uh, or that we can't do as a body of Christ. Amen? Now I want you to understand when, I, when I'm hurt and I need your encouragement. When I'm, when I'm feeling sad, I need your encouragement. You know, I, I need it. Man, when I'm, when I'm getting ready to fall deep into sin, I need your wisdom. I need my brothers and sisters to say, hey, Brother Joel, I'm worried about you. Hey, Brother Joel, you need to watch out for that. See, that's what we need as a body of believers. And you know, you learn the lesson of geese, and they fly together. And they, they fly in a V. And I want you to understand, that lead bird is the strongest bird. And the weakest birds are in the, in the back because they're, they're receiving the draft from the front. But we've got to be united. Matter of fact, when Jesus went to the cross, before he went to the cross, he prayed first of all for himself. Second of all, he prayed for the disciples. He, he basically said, you know what, I'm leaving disciples in this, this wicked world. I'm not taking them out, but I'm, I'm leaving them here. And the one thing he prayed, he said, Lord, I pray that they be one. They be united. Not only did he pray for them, but he prayed for you and me. Because he said, I'm praying not only for the disciples, but I'm praying for the ones that will hear the message of the disciples. And you know what his prayer for them? That they may be one. That they be united. I want you to understand the truth this morning, people. God is not the author of confusion. God is not the author of division. The old devil's the author of division. The old devil's the one that will get inside your marriage and he will plant a seed of doubt. He will plant a wedge of division, just a seed. And if not careful, that seed will grow. And that wedge will grow and that division will grow. And before long, you, you have that couple splitting apart. But the same principle in a nation it's the same principle in the church. When you, have, when you have division coming to a church, let me tell you something, people. God is not the author of division. If you don't get anything else, get that this morning. God has not called us to be divided. God brings us all together to be one. Amen? Because there is power. And just like God looking at the children, you know, in Genesis when he said, you know, nothing is possible with them. He looks at his church and he says, you know what? Nothing's impossible with them as long as they stay united. Paul, like I said, he wrote many verses in the Bible and he would speak to all churches and he would have the common thing. You know, he would say, you know, I, I want you to guard against this. I want you to guard against this. Hey, watch out for this guy. You know, just do this. But every letter that he wrote to all the churches, one common theme of every letter said, you got to be united. You got to have unity. In the church at Ephesus, in Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And then he writes, There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called in the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. There's one. One body, one flesh, one spirit, one soul, one God, one faith. You see the theme of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus? You got to remain this one. And I can't stress that enough. Flu Ellen, we've got to be one in Christ, with one God, with one leader. And our leader is Jesus Christ. One. When he wrote to the church at, at Rome, in Romans 12, 16, he said, Be of the same mind toward one another. And then in verse 14, our chapter 14, verse 19, he said, Pursue the things which make for peace 
where one may edify one another. Chapter 15, he goes on to say, be like-minded toward one another that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God. You see the thing, be one, 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 one. So I want you to understand the first lesson we get from this flock of geese is that when they're flying, there goes another flock right there. I mean, they're, they're riding as one. Yeah. And who are they? They're my people. I, I love the riders, man. I, I'll catch up with y'all a little bit later. Uh, be one. First Corinthians, he, he, 110, he said, speak the same thing, that there be no division among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Second Corinthians, he goes on, he says, be complete. Be of one mind, live in peace. You see, the theme of the Bible is one. And just like we learned from that flock of geese flying as one unit, there's strength in that. And I can't stress that enough. You know how many churches are being ripped apart because they're, they're, there's division in that church? Now, here's the thing. When we're walking as a body of Christ... It doesn't mean that we, we have the same mind where we don't have our own opinion. And I want you to get that. That's like a marriage. Lynn and I, we've been married for 31, 32 years, 31, year, yeah, 31 years. Uh, she has her own mind, her own brain, and I have my mind. My, and we may look at a situation, we may see, see it a little bit different, but at the end of the day, we're going to come together and we're going, to, we're going to be one. We may have a different opinion, but we're going to be one. I want you to understand, we're not supposed to walk around like Gomer and Luann on the Gomer Pyle show, and, and we say, well, Gomer, whatever you want. No, Luann, whatever you want. No, we all have a brain. We all have a mind. We all have our opinion. But I want you to understand, when the body of Christ comes together and, and, and they make a decision, hey, we need to go this direction, you need to put your feelings and your, your ideas and all that, you need to put that aside and you need to say, hey, where can I serve you? How can I help you? You know, one of the testimonies, and I didn't even know this guy. One of the testimonies of one of your former members, and I, uh, Ms. Pryor, I'm going to brag about your, your husband that's gone on to be with the Lord. One thing that I heard about this, this guy, that he may not be in agreement with it, and he may speak to him and say, hey, I don't think we ought to do this. But at the end of the day, when the church voted to do something, what I understand about this guy, he would be the first one there with the hammer in his hand saying, what do you need me to do? You see how that works? You see how that works in the body of Christ? And when you, like I said, it may not be that you agree 100%, but it means that we come together and we're united. And I want you to understand, we don't grumble and we don't complain and we don't do anything like that because here's the truth, nothing of that is of God. Matter of fact, I'm getting ready to bring some messages from the book of James, and it talks about taming the tongue. And the Bible says that the tongue is like poison. And a lot of times, if you're not careful, you'll spew out poison. And it's like putting poison in water. It may be just a little bit of poison, but it, but it ruins the whole tank of water. So you've got to be real careful. Number one lesson, we fly together as a flock of geese. Here's the second letter. When a goose falls out of formation, it suddenly feels the drag and the resistance of flying alone. It quickly moves back into formation to take advantage of the lifting power of the bird immediately in front of it. Like I said, you need the church. You need the church. And I can't stress that enough. You need the church. Because when you're trying to fly solo, you feel the weight of the world. You feel the drag on a... You know, when we were in seminary, we, we had an old escort. We sold everything. We kept this little escort because it was basically new, new and it got great gas mileage. And imagine me and, and Lynn and Corey and Ashley when they're small and an escort just packed with stuff. And I remember we would come in occasionally, we would come back home occasionally, and you know, that old escort, I mean, it was grunting to make it back to Nashville. And you know what I would do? I would find a truck, 
And I would get behind that truck and I would let that, that 18 wheeler just kind of pull me along. My brother was a truck driver for uh, Parthenon Metals years ago. And he, he, he said he could always feel when somebody was drifting behind him because it would, it would be the truck that was doing all the work and these cars would line up behind him and they would kind of drift and they would let the truck do the work and they would just kind of drift behind it. When I was coming home with the kids and with Lynn, we would, we would get behind an 18-wheeler and we would drift behind that truck. And any time that truck would leave or, or get off the exit, I could, would immediately feel the weight of the car. I would immediately lose that power because the car just didn't have that much power. I want you to understand this truth right here. Because we are flying as a, in a V like a, a flock of goose, the ones in front are the ones with the strength. And the ones behind are, are pulling off of that strength. Now I want you to understand, you may be a new Christian in this room. You may be a new believer in this room. You may be one that's struggling with your faith. And let me tell you something, you need the church because if you walk away from the church, and if you try to do it on yourself, you're going to feel the weight of the world. And let me tell you something, the world has no pity on us. Amen? The world will, will eat you up and throw you out. We need the, we need the church. But right here is right here's the common goal. You're not supposed to fly in the back of the flock for a long time. You're supposed to get, and we looked at it the other night in our Bible study about, about starting to you know, throw away the milk of the word and start eating on pure, our pure food, meat, growing in your walk with the Lord, you're supposed to be one that don't fly in the back very long. You're supposed to start moving your way in the V. But you need the V. You need the flock. You need the church. And let me tell you something. It's like I've, I've shared before. Jesus Christ is our head goose. Jesus Christ is the head of this church. I believe God is a God of order, and I believe God places pastors in, in, in place, and I believe God places deacons in place, and I believe God places elders and bishops in place. I believe that God, and to be honest about it, to be a New Testament church, we really need elders in this church to be a New Testament church. And you know, it's not a Baptist thing, but we need to seriously look at that because it's a biblical thing. And God places people in, in order. But let me tell you something. Our lead goose is Jesus. And we should never lose sight of that. And if you ever get involved in the church where that pastor or that group of deacons or those elders or a group of family tried to take that lead, let me tell you something. You better run away from that church because it's not a godly church. It's not a biblical church. So... When it falls out of place, the goose that falls, it will get back in place. Here's a third fact. When the goose loose, or the, when the lead goose tires, it rotates back into the formation. And a, another goose flies to the point of that position. Did you hear that? When that lead, lead goose gets tired, it will drop out and another goose will go get in that spot. I want you to understand, sometimes it's tiresome to be the pastor. Sometimes it's tiresome to be the leader. And I love all the scriptures. I love the scripture where it talks about when Moses was on the side of that hill and, the, and they're in the battle with the Amalekites and Joshua's in the valley with the Amalekites. The Bible says that, that Moses had two guys beside him and they were lifting up the arms of, of Moses because the Bible says that as long as he held the rod up, the Israelites won the battle. And when the, the rod would drop, the Amalekites would, would start winning the battle. As long as it was up, and here's the thing, what it took to keep that rod up was the guys didn't grab the rod, but they did lift Moses' arms. I want you to hear this truth, people. Sometimes it's tough being that, that shepherd. Sometimes it's tough being that pastor. 
Sometimes it's tough being that youth minister. Sometimes it's tough being that, that worship leader. Sometimes it's tough being that, that children's minister. Sometimes it's tough being that chairman of that, that committee. Sometimes it's tough being that Sunday school teacher. And I want you to understand, there are times in that situation where that, that Sunday school teacher or that youth minister or that pastor needs to take a break and somebody else has got to go and they've got to lead the way for a while. They've got to fly, fly in front for a while. Now here's the thing, it doesn't... Dis, it doesn't say, hey, you're the new pastor because God has an order. But there's times where the pastor needs help. There's times where the pastor gets discouraged. There's times where the pastor needs just a pat on the back going, you know, we appreciate you. But it's the same thing with every person in leadership here. And I want you to understand, when it, when it gets to where you get, become tired, that's when somebody else has got to step into place and take that leadership for a while to let that person just get some refreshing so that they can fly and let somebody else minister to them. You know one thing I love at this church? I love small groups. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, if you're not in a small group, you need to get in a small group. I can't stress that enough. You need to get in a small group. Now, our small group, we've got a great, I'm in Bradley and Andrew's small group. We've got a great small group. I mean, we have Bible study, we have fellowship, we laugh. But you know what they allow me to do? In this small group, and this is why, and I'm not slamming any other small group because you would do the same thing. They allow me to go in that small group and just be another member of that group. Just to, just to study God's Word with them. They don't expect me to teach that small group. They don't expect me to, they don't look at me and go, well, Brother Joy, what do you think? 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 Let me tell you, I love the idea where I can just go in that, that small group and be ministered to. And I can't, I can't share this enough, and I can't stress this enough. If you're not in a small group, you're missing a blessing. Amen? You need to get in Sunday school. You need to get in other things. In Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, Paul wrote this, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith. Right? So there's that word unity again. And later on it talks about growing. And it, later on it talks about we're all a, a, a body with ligaments and we grow together. That fact, number three, is when that leader gets tired, man, it's tired, time for somebody else to rotate in that spot. And here, once again, it goes back to the Scripture that talks about, you know, we're all part of the body of Christ. We all have capabilities. We all have times where we give our talents. Now, this is, this is one thing. It's like this week. I've been spending this week because this week is when we had organizations. And I normally spend on organization week. I just spend that whole week just researching sermons. Researching sermons. And you know, sometimes I think people feel like I just get up here on Sunday morning and, and I say, well, I, I believe I'll preach on this today. Sometimes I think people in the church feel like the praise and worship team get here on Sunday morning and they, they pull out a book and go, what are we going to sing today? I want you to understand, whether it be the music, whether it be the preaching, whether it be the stuff going on in that youth building, whether it be the ch stuff in children's church, we church, uh, the well, wiggle worship, well, all that stuff, man, there's a lot of effort, there's a lot of time, there's a lot of sweat, and, and there's a lot of stuff going into that. And I want you to understand, those lead geese, they need your help. They need you to step in sometime and say, hey, how can I serve you? How can I help you? There's truth in that. Here, here's the fourth fact. And I love this. The geese flying in the formation honk to encourage those up front to keep the, their speed. 
you ever wondered why they honk? Because you'll see that flock of geese flying over and you'll hear that honk, honk, honk. And you'll hear that and you'll hear it and you're wondering why are they honking? Researchers, and like I said, they, they've done, this is all documented. They, they honk to encourage the one in front. They honk to encourage each other as they fly. Now, when I go down into Nashville, sometimes somebody will honk at me and they're not saying, hey, buddy, I love you. You know, <laughs> you know the honking I'm talking about. What? And I, are you an encourager in this church? You know, in the New Testament, they had a guy by the name of Barnabas. And he was known for being an encourager. And you know, if you read Scripture, he was, all, he was known as an encourager. He was always lifting others up. And I want you to understand, we need to be encouraging each other. We need to be lifting each other up. Now there's, and I want you to understand this truth, that's not saying that we overlook sin. That's not saying that we don't hold each other accountable. That's not what I'm saying. Because in the Bible it says that there are times where we need to, to be honest with each other. But here's the key, we do it in love. We don't do it out of bitterness. We don't do it out of anger. We don't do it in a, in a divisive form. But is your honking encouraging? Are you encouraging the brothers that are hurting? The sisters that are going through a tough time? Or is everything out of your mouth negative and, and ugly and gossip? Now, you know, a lot of times we look in the scriptures and we talk about murder and adultery and stuff like that. But the Bible talks as much about an ugly tongue where there's poison in what you say. We, as a body of believers, we need to encourage each other. We need to lift each other up. We need to... It's like today, for example. A friend of ours passed away from Neely's Ben, uh, uh, Morris early. He was a, a man of the church where... I grew up and, and their family and our family grew up at Neely's Been Baptist today. Now, he's going to be down at, he's down at Forest Lawn Funeral Home. We're going down there today. I haven't seen the early family in a lot, many, many years. Probably the last time I saw them is when my father passed away and they came to the funeral home and they came to encourage us. We're going down there today. We have no wisdom to tell them. We don't have any deep secret where we can say, hey, right here. We, we're not going to go down there and just share biblical truth with them. We're just going to go down there and we're, we're going to love on them. We're going to cry with them. We're going to go and encourage them. I want you to understand, people, that's what the body of Christ looks like. That's what the church looks like. And I've shared with you time and time, just like a marriage, when one hurts, you both hurt. When one of you is rejoicing, you both rejoice. You both celebrate. People, make sure that your honking is lifting up. Make sure that your honking is encouraging people. Because if not careful, not only will you not be destructive, but you'll be ripping people apart, and you'll be so divisive and so discouraging where you may cause people to not get saved. And I believe the scripture where it says we'll all stand before God one day and we'll give an account of every word spoken. And, you know, that's a promise from God. And I would hate the thought of knowing that I would stand before God one day and because of the words of my mouth and, and the bitterness in my heart to be what kept somebody from going to heaven. I've, I've, been real, I've been real open with you. Before I met Jesus, man, I was a punk. I was ugly. 
I said things that hurt people. And I mean, it just breaks my heart some of the things I did. But here's the thing. When Jesus got a hold of me, he changed me. When Jesus got a hold of me, he took that ugliness out of my heart and he started working on my mouth. Now here's the truth. Right here out of everything, this is the hardest thing to tame. Amen. I know I'm not the only sinner in this room. This is the hardest thing to tame. We need to be where we encourage people and we lift people up. Because let me tell you something, we live in a world where that's what they need. Here's the last thing. When a goose gets sick or wounded or shot down, two geese will drop out of the formation and they'll follow it down to help protect it. And they'll stay with it until it dies or is able to fly again. Then they will launch out with another formation or they will catch up with the old flock. And I love that picture of a goose being shot down or, or falling because it's, it's sick. And I love the picture of two geese going down with them, sitting with them, probably getting food just to try to nourish them. I love, I love some of the commercials on TV. Some of the commercials I wish weren't on TV. But there's one commercial that I love on TV, and it's, it's of the Special Olympics. And you know the commercial I'm talking about. And it's a group of kids, and they look like they have Down syndrome. And you know, God loves them, and we love them. And I love they're running that race. And in the, in the commercial, one of them falls down, and they all stop running, and they come back to the one that had fallen. And they love on that guy, and they help, and they pick that guy up. And in arm in arm, they, they finish the race together. I love that picture because that's what the church looks like. Or that's what the church should look like. Let me tell you something, people. Like, I, like I've shared, man, when one of us hurt, we need to all hurt. When one of us is struggling, we need to all struggle. We need to minister to that person. And we need to help, help that person get that strength back. And we should, we should be the body of Christ. Here, here's the truth, the sad truth. A lot of times in the church, we shoot our wounded. We pile on. And what I love about a lot of the stories in the New Testament, like, for example, the lady, and I preached on it a few weeks ago, the lady that was caught in adultery, and the, the one that had a not a favorable reputation in time. The Bible says she was probably a harlot. And, and she, she uh, wet Jesus' feet with the tears and she wiped his feet. And everybody in that room said, you know, if Jesus knew who was touching him, he wouldn't allow it. But I want you to understand, Jesus didn't pile on. Jesus didn't look at her because he could have gained favor by saying, yep, she's a harlot. Yep, she's got a questionable uh, reputation. Yep, I don't want you touching me. But the Bible says he loved on her. He ministered to her. He met her needs. People, that's what the church looks like. Man, when a goose falls and when a goose is hurt, those two will fall and they will minister and they will encourage and they will help uh, replenish that food. And they'll try to get that bird flying again. <coughs> Excuse me. We need to be that. We need to be that goose. Because I'm sure there's people in this room, you're hurting. There's people in this room, you're dealing with something. There's people in this room, it may be a marriage that's hurting. It may be a finances that's hurting. It may be Situations with your children, with your parents, with some loved one. And instead of us being judgmental, instead of us sitting on our judgmental, self-righteous throne, we need to just weep with you, hurt with you, just help you get replenished. That's what the church looks like.
We can learn a lot from geese. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now. Father, we love you and we praise you. And, and Father, I, you're so awesome that you even take birds in the air and we learn from them. Father, I don't think it's by accident that this is the characteristics of these animals. Father, I believe with all my heart that you placed that in them so that we could learn from them. Father, help us to not be so ignorant to where we think that we're smarter than some geese in the air. Father, I pray that we will be that church that meet together where we love each other, where we lift each other up. Father, I pray that we'll be that church where we encourage each other. But Father, most of all, I pray that we'll be that church where we, we follow that lead goose and that lead goose is Jesus. Father, we're nothing without Jesus. Father, we praise His sweet and holy name. And Father, I pray if there's anyone in this room that's not saved. Father, I pray if there's anyone in this room that's hurting, that's, that's needing to find the way, help them to realize that it's only through Jesus Christ. Father, whatever anyone is struggling with today, Father, I pray that they'll bring it to this altar. I pray that they'll just cry out to you. Father, I cry out to you right now. Father, I pray for my, my grandbabies. Father, I proclaim Jesus as Lord of their life. Father, I pray for Aiden and Willow where they will one day receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Father, I pray that you have your angels guard them and keep them safe. And Father, just like I cried out for my grandbabies, Father, I, I know that there's others in this room that they have grandchildren and they have children that they're crying out for. Father, I pray that you hear our cries and you hear our hurts. Father, there's people in this room that's crying out for their marriage. Father, there's people in this room that's crying out for their health. And they're crying out for their finances. And they're crying out for a job. And, and Father, they're crying out because they can't beat this addiction. So Father, whatever they're crying out for, Father, just hear the cry. Not only just hear the cry, but answer that prayer. Father, there's people in this room crying out for salvation. Or they've, they've tried everything else. They've tried all the other roads. They've tried all the drugs and, and all the things of this life that thought would bring them pleasure. Thought that would take up that empty spot in their heart. But Father, I pray that they cry out to you for salvation to fill that spot. So, Father, just whatever they're, they're crying out for, Father, I pray that you start healing today. Father, we sure do love you and we praise you. We, we say this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I share with you every, every week that right here is where healing happens. And I believe that there's something, too, coming to this altar. Not being ashamed to come to this altar to say God I need you so if you're battling with anything if you, if you need to just come to this altar just come to this altar and pray if you need some type of spiritual help Bradley and I can help you on each side of the stage but I beg of you don't leave the, the doors saying hey I should have done something because right now is where it happens let's stand